Welcome to Health Focus, where we focus on your health. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Anderson. You know, the month of April has been designated as Oral Cancer Awareness Month by the Oral Cancer Foundation. And actually, although we may not always talk about things like cancer involving the mouth or the tongue or the throat, it's a major public health problem in our country. Sadly, we see almost 50,000 cases of oral cancer per year. And this translates into as many as 132 do people dying every year due to oral cancer. And if you do the math, uh, it's really an enormous toll on our country and something that we should try to do better to prevent. So today on Health Focus, we're going to talk a little bit about that with a distinguished uh, expert. But before I introduce our expert guest, I'd just like to point out a few things uh, as a physician who sees individuals who come into my office with this problem. Uh, there are risk factors that we have been able to identify for oral cancer, and many of them are modifiable, meaning we could really try to minimize them or eliminate them. For example, tobacco exposure, whether it be smoking or chewing. Another would be consumption of alcohol. Alcohol is considered a cancer-causing agent by the International Association on Research for Cancer. And there are also some viruses that we've come to appreciate that may cause cancer. So this is a serious problem. And in fact, most authorities recommend screening for oral cancer beginning at age 18. If an individual starts smoking earlier, say in the early teens, that screening should start when smoking starts. And the screening may involve a physical examination that involves not just looking in the mouth, but also the neck for swollen lymph nodes, for example. So this is a very important topic. And here at Health Focus, we thought we would focus on this for this month. In fact, we're not the only ones interested in this. I mentioned the Oral Cancer Foundation, and they are having numerous events to commemorate Oral Cancer Month, including an awareness walk on April 21st, which I believe occurs on the peninsula at Foothill College. You could check with them for more details, as I don't have all the specifics for that. Closer to home, we're trying to raise our awareness of this issue through education. Along these lines, we're very fortunate to have with us a distinguished guest, a local doctor of dental surgery, Dr. Jacqueline Q. Lim. Welcome to Health Focus, Dr. Lim. It's Thank certainly you. a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lim is actually a native of Benicia. And uh, after going to Benicia, she attended, I believe, Cal Poly, a very distinguished uh, college in Southern California, well known for its scientific training. She went on to the uh, very excellent medical school, the University of the Pacific School of Dentistry. Uh, I say medical school because dentists are doctors. They're doctors of dental surgery. And Dr. Lim, I believe, is a doctor of dental surgery who is really respected in the community, not just for her expertise and technical skills, but she's known also for really putting her patients at ease and making them feel comfortable. So, you know, I'd like to start, if I may, before we get into this subject of oral cancer, Dr. Lim. I, I mentioned a little bit about your background, but you're obviously somebody who is very successful educationally. What led you to choose dentistry as a career? And what is it about dentistry that allows you to really touch people's lives and make a difference? Yeah, so um, from a young age, I knew I wanted to be a dentist. Uh, I had an orthodontist, Dr. Tom Campbell, local. His wife is also a dentist, general dentist, and they work in the same practice. And you know, I thought, oh, wow, they seem like they have a good job. It wasn't until later that I realized that Dentistry can have a huge impact on people, changing people's smile, getting them out of pain. It's really rewarding and awesome to see. And I now practice with Dr. Tom Campbell and Dr. Carrie Carney, so it's really neat. Tell us a little bit about where you practice. Do you still practice in Benicia, or do you have more than one office? Yeah, so I practice in two offices, um, part-time in a Fairfield office called Freedom Dental, and then again in the Benicia office with Drs. Carney, Campbell, and uh, Vitegas, yeah. Okay, and I realize that as a dentist, you have a lot of responsibilities. People care about their cosmetic appearance, they have dental pain, and of course now there's a lot of uh, preventive dentistry just to keep people healthy before they have a problem. 
So my question is, as we contemplate oral cancer awareness, um, is this an issue where you encounter areas of concern just by chance or as part of screening in your dental practice? And how big of a problem do you perceive it to be just on a day-to-day -day basis as mm -hmm. a dentist who's practicing? So um, with all our examinations, we do an oral cancer screening, make sure that everything looks normal. Um, that will be done at every regular checkup. Um, of course, if a patient has a problem, they're welcome to come in, let us know what's going on, and we can check them out at any time. Um, I personally have only run across uh, throat cancer once, which was pretty recently, uh, maybe last, uh, last December. Patient came in, he had about uh, the size of a golf ball lump underneath his jaw here on the lower left-hand side. No pain, discomfort, we did all the normal testing to see if it was tooth-related. It was not, so I recommended he see his medical doctor. Um, I followed up with the patient because I hadn't heard back from him, and it did end up being throat cancer, but he went through uh, radiation and chemo, he's doing well. That's fantastic, that's yeah. a success story. And you know, I teach medical students at UC Davis School of Medicine, and I encourage them to do a complete physical, including looking carefully in the mouth. Mm -hmm. But let's face it, if somebody comes in with a sprained ankle, or um, you know, a sore elbow, I'm a rheumatologist, often you know, many people who are in the medical profession won't look that carefully in the mouth. They right. should, but they may not do so on every occasion. So I think, isn't it fair to say dentists are really on the front line in battling oral cancer? Absolutely. That's why we recommend, you know, visiting a dentist regularly mm -hmm. every six months or so. Um, it's preventative. You yeah. know, we, right. if we're able to see something early, then we can at least stop it or, you know, at least, you know, be the first line of defense. So, unfortunately, oral cancer is found in the later stages. Right. And you mentioned the check you do. Is that the same thing that I would call a pathology check where dentists palpate the neck and... Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, with that check, what uh, we're really looking at is, you know, I'll go through mine, for example. So, I always start at the base of the jaw here, mm -hmm. work my way down the neck, and like you said, make sure there's no lumps or bumps that shouldn't be there. I'll check the tongue, have the patient stick the tongue out, check either side of the tongue, underneath the tongue, uh, feel the floor of the mouth, um, make sure to look down the tongue into the back of the throat. You want to look in all those areas. Again, we're looking for any suspicious lesions. We can't, you know, determine whether or not it, that's cancer right away, but at least we can, you know, see if we see any changes in the tissue. Right, and I think it's worth pointing out, Dr. Lim, that we also sometimes see precancerous lesions meaning that we see lesions that really are not yet cancerous but somewhat abnormal, let us say in someone who chews tobacco. Mm -hmm. And in that setting, uh, perhaps by biopsying the lesion, maybe removing it with a very minimal surgical procedure and some education to stop using tobacco, I, someone in your position could save a life. Right, absolutely. Yeah, let's talk about the referral. So let's say you see somebody in your practice who has a little white patch that looks like it could be cancerous. Mm -hmm. I think the medical term that we most often use is leukoplakia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's say this person is a smoker and you see a little patch. Uh, walk us through what you would do under those circumstances. Would you yourself do a biopsy? Would you refer to an oral surgeon? How do you approach that? So myself, I always like to take a photo. We'll take measurements um, and inform the patient and let them know what's going on. But I uh, generally refer out to an oral surgeon uh, the oral surgeon will then, you know, take a look with their own eyes. It's always great to have a new set of eyes to take a look at the area. Um, they may take a biopsy, so a tissue sample. That tissue sample will be sent to a pathologist, um, which can determine whether or not the cells there are cancerous. And uh, could you explain the different medical specialists? For example, I have interacted with oral surgeons. Some of them have the DDS degree, mm -hmm. some have the DMD degree, and some of them are MDs, or medical doctors who specialize in uh, maxillofacial surgery. Right. Could you just kind of explain that for our audience a little bit? So uh, DDS, Doctor of Dental Surgery, and DMD, Doctor of Dental Medicine, uh, they are the same education. Okay. So you go to dental school and you receive one of those degrees. Uh, and then 
an oral surgeon will go through a residency program. They have four-year programs and they have six-year programs. The six-year programs, they actually go through some courses in medicine and they receive their medical doctorate degree as well. And they have to do the same medical testing that right. you did. So I think it's worth pointing out that whether you're a DDS or an MD, uh, you know, the issue of maintaining the health of the oral cavity is critical. And what dentists do is much more than just maintaining a healthy smile. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, at what age do you recommend a young kid go see a dentist for the first time? As soon as they see their first tooth come through, mm -hmm. um, we just want to make sure that the, pa uh, the parents are educated and they know how to take care of the teeth, they know what to look for, mm -hmm. they know what kind of foods to avoid and, and that are good for the teeth. Just make sure that everything stays healthy from okay. that tooth on. And once you get into the adult years, let us say perhaps someone has had orthodontic care, perhaps not, and mm -hmm. somebody's an adult generally feeling well with no real problems, how often should that person see a dentist? Every six months. Every six months you want to just check on it. Um, we take notes. We take very thorough notes of what um, treatment has been done in the past, what treatment mm -hmm. needs to be done, what areas can be watched. Um, so that way we can see if anything grows or changes. Yeah. I have uh, met a lot of people socially and also encountered patients who really have the opinion that if you don't have a toothache, you don't need to see a dentist. Why bother? Right. Uh, when you have a toothache, that's going to be the worst time because okay. that's going to be something like a root canal or extraction. Oftentimes, small cavities, they, are, they generally are not, you know, there's no discomfort, no pain, right. but we can see them radiographically and that's when you want to kind of stop them from going any further and hitting the nerve and causing discomfort. Right. I, I think sometimes too, if a person has a negative experience with a dentist early in life, mm -hmm. it can cause that person to have fear forever. And I know that you have a really good bedside manner, I guess you'd say chairside manner. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do to set your patients at ease? I know you're well known for that. Yeah, I just, I talk to them. I let them know, you know, everything's going to be okay. I'm not here to harm you. I'm here to help you. Um, I want you to feel comfortable. So anytime that, you know, you have an issue, you, we stop, you let me know what's going on and anything that I can do to make you comfortable, I will. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, let's get back a little bit to oral cancer. Uh, I guess when we're looking at the risk factors I outlined, we're talking about a kind of risk stratification meaning that if you see somebody who doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't have viral exposures that are of concern, the risk is lower. Correct. Do you engage in any patient education to educate people about issues relative to, to tobacco, for example? Um, you know, if a patient comes in and they, of course, say that they use tobacco, I'd like to educate them and let them know what's going on, of course, of course. Can you tell, for example, if somebody regularly consumes tobacco products or wine just by looking in the mouth? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, of course, anyone that drinks wine, you're going to have a little bit of staining. Yeah. Uh, you'll see that on the teeth. Uh, while you're drinking the wine, your teeth may turn purple. But uh, over time, you'll start to see you know, dark brown staining around the teeth. Um, as far as smoking goes or use of tobacco, you can see white spots in the mouth or even the gum tissue kind of reacts in a different way when uh, measuring the gum tissue. So there have been some high-profile cases, for example, of oral cancer associated with chewing tobacco, mm -hmm. um, particularly in baseball players. In fact, it's become something of a political issue. I think uh, there was a famous Hall of Fame uh, baseball player who died a, at a young age uh, from an oral cancer. And um, I think since that time, some of the uh, baseball organizations have discouraged chewing tobacco, which was really a part of the culture in baseball, mm -hmm. chewing and spitting, you know, kind of a way of uh, showing your toughness and, you know, asserting yourself on the field. And also you get a bit of a high from the nicotine, so you're a little more energetic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of the baseball teams have moved away from that. And uh, I guess that's a positive development. Absolutely. I definitely agree. Uh, tobacco in any form is going to cause harm. You know, it's, it's, it's the number one preventable risk factor. So we can avoid, you know, seeing oral cancers by just stopping use of tobacco. And another thing is, although we're focusing on oral cancer, I think it's important to recognize that the oral cavity is connected to other organs. Absolutely. So, for example, if you get a cancer that develops in the back of the throat, what we call the oropharynx, mm -hmm. well, first of all, those are the cancers that tend to be... Um, 
more likely to spread into surrounding areas. Mm -hmm. And so the development could be a throat cancer or if it actually gets down into the larynx and the tissues there could even present as a lung cancer. And uh, so these areas are all connected and the mouth of course is close to the sinuses also. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's why craniofacial surgery is so complicated. The anatomy is enormously complicated. Right, right. Yeah. I always like to inform my patients that the oral cavity or your mouth is the entrance to the rest of your body. So anything that goes through your mouth is going to go systemic. So you want to keep that healthy so you can keep the rest of your body healthy. Right. Now let's say someone has some bad habits and wants to change. So you see uh, a patient who is a very heavy smoker mm -hmm. and says, you know, Dr. Lim, I'd, I'd like to get over this terrible habit because I'm worried about my oral health. Mm -hmm. Um, are there concrete steps that you could take as a dentist? Do you provide them with pamphlets? Definitely. Um, Smokefree.gov has helpful tools and um, expert advice that they can look into. Um, you have to remind the patient, though, it's very difficult. It takes a person an average of seven times to quit smoking to actually quit smoking. So right. um, just inform information. That's so important and absolutely true. Uh, although having a doctor tell you to quit smoking is a major beneficial factor in leading to smoking cessation, most people fail before they succeed. Right, right. And uh, in talking about oral cancer, I also think that the, the culture has changed. I mean, let's face it, the first Surgeon General's report linking lung cancer to cigarette smoking was issued by um, the uh, then Surgeon General, I think it was Dr. Luther Terry in 1964, but it took a full generation for smoking rates to really decline. Mm -hmm. And now in California, they're, they're pretty low. I think they're almost as low as 10%. Mm -hmm. But in the mid 60s, they were closer to 50%, particularly mm -hmm. among men. And I think in other cultures, we still have huge problems with high rates of smoking. For example, in some Asian countries. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a long ways to go. Right. And with the introduction of smokeless tobacco and how the uh, tobacco industry is marketing these, you know, cherry flavored or, or strawberry flavored tobacco, you know, it's introducing it to a younger audience. Right. Almost like candy. Uh, you know, I realize that this is a contentious issue, but what do you think about e-cigarettes? Some people who try to quit smoking have even been advised to try e-cigarettes as a sort of risk reduction method, but it certainly is not approved for anything, and most doctors frown on even e-cigarettes. Right, um, you know, maybe as a bridge with the end goal being in mind of quitting using tobacco, because again, that's the number one preventable risk factor that we can stop. Okay, now we're focusing on oral cancer, but uh, another thing that I'm aware of is that uh, there are general medical conditions that manifest, they show up really in the mouth. And an example would be, for example, someone who's diabetic mm -hmm. may have lack of salivary flow, mm -hmm. or people on certain medications mm -hmm. may have a lack of salivary flow. That's not good for their oral health, right? No. So uh, dry mouth, as you hear it being called, um, creates an environment for um, a really acidic environment in your mouth. And so that's a perfect environment for bacteria to grow and cause dental caries, cause gum disease, all that bad stuff. So saliva is very important. When you're seeing older people who maybe have a history of heavy smoking in the past but quit, uh, do they need pathology checks more frequently than younger people or do you still follow the every six month rule? I would still follow the every six month rule. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, another thing about cancer that I think is interesting is that going back hundreds of years, there's been an association of uh, topical irritation of tissues with cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, this was actually first described uh, by veterinarians. Horses who have repeated trauma to their back from saddles that don't fit get mm -hmm. skin cancers, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, do you ever see tissue breakdown that might be precancerous from let us say, poorly fitting dentures. I mean, I just don't know. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Right, yeah. You can definitely tell ill-fitting dentures or a patient that wears their dentures all the time. So we highly recommend to take your dentures out every night. Um, if it's not fitting properly, seek a dentist um, advice uh, because 
um, a lesion or a, a area in your mouth that's not healing um, is something suspicious and should be looked at. Okay. Now, uh, dentistry obviously has come a long ways. As a matter of fact, I think some would even say that dentists have done such a good job that they kind of almost cut down their own practice volume as a result of being so good at preventing cavities, for example. Uh, but it seems that every time advances are made, there are new challenges. Uh, where do you see the future of dentistry going, particularly with respect to uh, the battle against oral cancer? Do you see uh, new diagnostic imaging studies coming up? What do you see? Um, so recently, uh, there's been a fluorescent light that's been used in the mouth. Uh, they have different name brands, but I've heard of Oral ID or Velscope, I believe it's called. Um, so it's a fluorescent light that's shined into the mouth. And the thought there is that normal tissue will reflect back, um, I believe it's green, but abnormal tissue or suspicious tissue will reflect back black. Right. Um, you know, we're getting towards the end of our show, but there are a couple other issues that are worth discussing that I'd like to address. We mentioned a lot about tobacco and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And these particularly seem to be associated with cancers in the mouth, often in the salivary area or in the front of the mouth or the tongue. Uh, cancers that are more in the oropharynx or posterior part of the mouth have also recently been associated heavily with a particular kind of virus. Right. In fact, it's, it's got a long name. It's called human papilloma virus, but we abbreviate it as HPV. I understand that at the dental scientific meetings, this is a topic that's come up and is being discussed, et cetera? Mm -hmm. that, that is true. So HPV uh, is a sexually transmitted disease. Um, we find that the uh, they're being shown in the throat, as you say, starting in the base of the tongue and going into the folds of the tonsils. So this is a particularly difficult um, uh, thing to see. So that's why we recommend, you know, being checked out every six months uh, so that we can take a look down in that area because it's very difficult for patients to do that at home. And, you know, if you could, can you tell us again, um, just in case anyone in the audience has healthcare concerns, if they want to get in touch with you, uh, are most of your patients in Benicia or Vallejo or, or where do they come um, from? As I said, I have two practices. So I work in a practice in Fairfield. Um, right. m most of those patients are from Fairfield, but we have that, they come from Vacaville, Vallejo, um, and then again in Benicia as well, Benicia, Vallejo, some cross the bridge too. Right. Yeah. Well, that says that they like seeing you if they cross the bridge <laughs> to come and see you. That's right. And if they want to get in touch with you, uh, should they phone you or do you have a website? Uh, do have a website. Um, it escapes me right okay. now, uh, but uh, we can definitely hook you up with that information. Okay, great. Yeah. If they want to call in, what number should they call? Uh, there's two different numbers. So Fairfield office would be 707-422-2236, and the Benicia office is 707-745-1994. Okay, so... We've been focusing on a very serious topic, uh, oral cancer, because of Oral Cancer Awareness Month coming up in April. But obviously, uh, Dr. Lim is uh, available for general oral health and consultations to maintain that radiant smile, which we all want. <laughs> so in closing, and this has been a very informative uh, half hour, Dr. Lim, I wish we could go for a longer period of time because it's such an enormous topic. Yes. I think in conclusion, uh, I think we all agree that we have to increase the awareness of oral cancer, and that's why April being Oral Cancer Month is very important. Obviously, it's very important to the Oral Cancer Foundation, but I think it should also be very important to members of our community. Mm -hmm. If we could get that number, which is 49,750 people a year diagnosed with oral cancer, down to a lower level through prevention, that would be great. Uh, and if we could treat it more effectively, that would be great too. So in closing, remember at Health Focus, we focus on your health. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you have nothing but good health in the future.